Welcome to the History Guy Podcast, a podcast dedicated to stories of lesser-known historical events told by Lance Geiger, also known as the History Guy on YouTube. I'm Josh, your host, a writer for the channel and eldest son of the History Guy. We tell all kinds of stories about history, from the modern era to the ancient past, so you never know what we're going to talk about next. One thing you can be sure of, it is history that deserves to be remembered. We at The History Guy are also excited to announce a new way to interact with the team and The History Guy himself at Locals.com. Join The History Guy Guild for your one-stop location to chat with other history fans, get updates on the team, and more. You can join for free or pay as little as $5 a month to get access to live chats with The History Guy, looks behind the scenes, early access to ad-free videos, and more. Find us at thehistoryguyguild.locals.com. We look forward to seeing you there. On today's episode, the History Guy tells three stories about the history behind legendary figures. First, he tells the story of Bass Reeves, whose incredible life has similarities to the famous fictional lawman, the Lone Ranger. Then he takes a look at Lady Godiva and her famous ride. Finally, he tells the incredible true story behind an American folk hero, Johnny Appleseed. Without further ado, let me introduce the History Guy. The world, it seems, enjoys a good Western. Western films were the most popular genre of film from pretty much the beginning of film all the way up through the 1960s. And Western fiction has been popular in a number of different media, from books and comic books to radio and television. And it's a worldwide phenomenon that is as popular, it seems, in Europe and Asia as it is in the country where the stories supposedly occur. But of course, Western fiction only rarely accurately represents life on the American frontier. And so the intersection between fiction and reality offers us good insights both into the consumer of Western fiction and the reality of Western life. And a good example of that is in one of the most popular of the fictional characters of the Wild West and the little-known lawmen who most resemble that character. And it is a story that deserves to be remembered. So return with us now to the thrilling days of yesteryear. From out of the past come the thundering hoofbeats of the great horse, Silver. The Lone Ranger first rode into the hearts and minds of listeners courtesy Detroit area radio station WXYZ, with the title role voiced by actor George Seaton, who later won two Academy Awards for screenwriting, and said that he invented the famous catchphrase, hi oh Silver, because he couldn't whistle. WXYZ aired nearly 3,000 radio episodes of the show featuring a Texas Ranger who fought outlaws, accompanied by his faithful Indian companion, Tonto. According to the story, the Lone Ranger was one of six Texas Rangers who were caught in an ambush by the despicable Butch Cavendish gang. Later, a friendly Indian happens upon the scene and finds that one of the Rangers has survived. Tonto buries the dead Rangers, but makes six grave markers to hide the fact that one survived. He then nurses the injured Ranger back to health. The Ranger is forced to wear a mask to conceal his identity since he was supposed to have died, as he fights for justice against Butch Cavendish and his gang. The show was a classic Western and was popular partly because of the Ranger's strict moral code, which represented American values at the time and included phrases like, to have a friend, a man must be one, and all things change but truth, and that truth alone lives on forever. The Lone Ranger only used silver bullets because they reminded him that life is precious and, like the bullets, shouldn't be wasted. Along with the radio show, The Lone Ranger spurred two film serials in the 1930s, a popular television show that ran over 220 episodes between 1949 and 1957, two different cartoon series, a newspaper comic strip that ran for more than 30 years, dozens of adventure novels and comic books, a video game, hundreds of various toys, and seven feature films. And in one of the lesser-known connections, The Lone Ranger spawned a popular spin-off property where, according to the story in the original radio show, The Lone Ranger's young nephew, Dan, who appeared in both the radio show and the television show, has a son who eventually takes on again the role of mass crime fighter as the Green Hornet. But the popularity of The Lone Ranger begs an interesting question. Was there a real Lone Ranger? The answer is possibly. In 1915, novelist Zane Grey wrote a novel called The Lone Star Ranger, which itself was adapted for four different feature films. The character in the novel is fictionalized, but the novel was dedicated to a real Texas ranger named John Reynolds Hughes. While he was a rancher in Travis County, Texas, Hughes had tracked down a group that had stolen horses from his and other ranches. That drew the attention of the Texas rangers, who recruited him. 
He served as a Ranger for 28 years, the Texas Rangers' longest serving member. Hughes was known as one of the most effective of the Texas Rangers, and notably, when another Texas Ranger captain was killed in an ambush, Hughes, one of the Rangers' best trackers, relentlessly pursued the gang that had committed the ambush, somewhat like the story told in The Lone Ranger. While Hughes had certainly inspired Zane Grey, who knew and respected Hughes, it's less clear whether he was an inspiration for The Lone Ranger, but he was certainly an example of a dedicated Texas Ranger, and, like the story, had doggedly tracked down outlaws who had killed other Texas Rangers in an ambush. But when talking about The Lone Ranger, there's another story as well, that of lawman Bass Reeves, who was, according to one biographer, the closest real person to resemble The Lone Ranger. Bass Reeves had been born a slave in 1838, and as was common at the time, he had taken the last name of his owner as his own. Sometime in the early 1860s, he'd parted ways with that owner. Some stories say it's because he had a fight with his owner over a card game, and others say that he simply had heard that Lincoln was planning to free the slaves. But for whatever reason, Reeves escaped slavery and went to live in Indian Territory, modern-day Oklahoma, living among Cherokee, Seminole, and Creek Indians, and learning both the territory and many of the people's languages. He became a crack shot with a pistol and a rifle. After the war, when the 13th Amendment passed and he no longer had to fear being returned to slavery, he moved to Arkansas, where he became a successful rancher and had 10 children. Indian Territory was notoriously lawless, and many outlaws fled there to escape justice. In 1875, President Grant appointed a new judge of the U.S. Court for the Western District of Arkansas with the goal of addressing lawlessness in the Indian Territory. The judge then appointed a former Confederate general as the new U.S. Marshal who then hired 200 deputy U.S. Marshals, some of whom were among the most famous lawmen of the West. Having heard of Reeves' knowledge of the Indian Territory and familiarity with its people, the new Marshal hired him as one of those deputies. Bass Reeves became the first black deputy U.S. Marshal west of the Mississippi. He served for nearly 30 years and in that time brought in more than three thousand wanted outlaws. He survived numerous gunfights, and despite having both his belt and his hat shot off in different gunfights, he never himself took a bullet. He was one of the most feared and respected lawmen of the Indian Territory. He was known for dressing fastidiously and for wearing two Colt pistols with the butts faced forward for a quick draw. As was common for many Americans of the time, and certainly former slaves, he had never received a formal education and so never learned to read and write. Before he went on patrols, which could take months at a time, he would have someone read the outstanding warrants to him, which he could recite from memory. At first, Reeves might seem nothing like the Lone Ranger. He wasn't even a Texas Ranger and was never shot, more or less nursed back to health by a faithful Indian companion. But deputies in the Indian Territory would often travel only accompanied by a posse member, who would be a Native American. Although he was most known for riding a red stallion with a white blaze that highly resembled Tonto's horse Scout from the Lone Ranger television series, he was also known to ride a white horse, and while he did not wear a mask, he was known to use disguises when capturing outlaws. It is not hard to see how this dedicated lawman, traveling alone with his Indian companion, catching the bad guys, could be seen as, as one biographer described him, the closest real person to resemble the Lone Ranger. In the end, there's no real evidence that either Bass Reeves or John Ronald Hughes inspired the fictional character of the Lone Ranger. The creators of the character actually didn't mention any real lawmen at all. They said the Lone Ranger was inspired by Robin Hood and the actor Tom Mix. But both Reeves and Hughes bore some striking resemblance to the legendary masked ranger, and they show us that the, the, the vision of a lone lawman dispensing justice on the wild frontier is not merely a fabrication of the entertainment industry. It is interesting that both Reeves and Hughes had some similar backgrounds. Both as young men had spent substantial time in Indian Territory, where they developed the skills that would serve them later as lawmen. Both had been successful ranchers, which provided them with a vested interest in protecting the people of the frontier from lawlessness. And both had long and distinguished careers as lawmen, part of that special breed of people who bridged the gap between the Wild West and the modern world. And both were most certainly heroes, even though neither one is nearly as well known as the legendary Lone Ranger. Bass Reeves died of kidney disease in 1910 at the age of 71, and John Reynolds Hughes, who was in ill health and depressed over the fact that all his old friends had died, tragically took his own life in 1947. He was 92. But Bass Reeves is a great example of one of the things that Hollywood has largely gotten wrong over the years. To watch the golden age of American westerns, you might have guessed that the frontier was settled only by white cowboys. In fact, an estimated 20 to 25% of the Western cowboys were black, 
where the independence of the range offered a relative equality, even though they still faced discrimination and were often given the least favorable tasks. It is those true stories of the West that deserve to be remembered. Next up, the History Guide tells the true story behind Lady Godiva's famous ride. We don't know a lot about the life of individual women in medieval England. We know that life was harsh, that there were few options for women of any social strata in medieval England, that women weren't considered important enough to generally make the historical record. And yet there is one 11th century Coventry noblewoman whose name is known throughout the world. And the thing is, virtually everything you think you know about her is wildly inaccurate. And so today the history guy is going to try to delve into the forgotten real history of the world's most famous horseback ride. The Old English name Gajivu means gift of God and was a reasonably common name for women in medieval England. The Latinized version of the name is Godiva. The woman the world knows as Lady Godiva was the Countess of Mercia, wife of Leofric, the Earl of Mercia. We don't know the exact dates of her birth or death, but there are records of she and her husband's acts in the middle of the 11th century. She was independently wealthy, holding property that she had inherited from her father. To understand the world of Lady Godiva, we have to understand the context of English politics at the time. In the first decade of the 11th century, Svein Forkbeard, the King of Denmark, carried on a campaign against England, forcing English King Ethelred the Unready and his sons to flee into exile. Svein was made King of England on Christmas Day 1013, but died only a few weeks later as the result of a fall from a horse. Svein's eldest son, Harold II, became the new King of Denmark, but the Vikings, who had just defeated Ethelred, voted for Svein's younger son, Canute, to be the new King of England. But the Lords of England saw Svein's death as an opportunity. Ethelred was recalled from exile, and the English drove Canute and his army from England. However, Canute returned the next year with a substantial fleet, including Vikings from all over Scandinavia. Canute finally defeated the English army at the Battle of Ascendune in October of 1016. After the death of Ethelred's son, Edmund Ironside, in November, Canute the Great was crowned King of All England. Canute ruled England for just short of 20 years, and with the help of the English, he eventually came to rule Denmark, Norway, and much of Sweden as well, in what was called the North Sea Empire. As he protected England from the Viking raids that had been devastating England since the 9th century, England prospered under Canute, and he is considered one of the greatest of the Anglo-Saxon kings. In his early reign, he spent a deal of time eliminating challenges to his rule and purging and executing people he did not trust. One of those purges had to do with the Earldom of Mercia, formerly a kingdom in the English Midlands. Sometime between 1017 and 1023, Canute executed the former Earl and gave the Earldom to a member of one of the leading Anglo-Saxon families of the region. The new Earl was Leofric. As Earl of Mercia, Leofric was one of the most powerful rulers of England, and he was certainly a skilled politician, keeping his position and his head for nearly 40 years through the reigns of Canute, two of Canute's sons, and into the period where the Wessex dynasty was restored with the reign of Ethelred's son, Edward the Confessor. It is not clear when Leofric and Godiva married. We know that she outlived him, and it may have been a second marriage for both of them. At least one 12th century record records that she was a widow when they married. The earliest known mention of them as a couple has to do with the endowment of a Benedictine monastery in Coventry in 1043. And while Leofric and Godiva were recorded with many such acts of charity, the dedication of that monastery says much about Leofric, Godiva, and the period. The monastery was built on the ruins of a nunnery that had been destroyed during Canute's invasion in 1016. Godiva and Leofric, like Canute, were Christians, and all seemed to have felt the need to atone for the destruction of the period of conflict that brought Canute to the throne. Canute, like Godiva and Leofric, was well known for his ecumenical gifts, giving lands, freedom from taxes, and religious relics to churches and monasteries. Much of what we know about Godiva and Leofric comes from their charity to the church. They were benefactors of monasteries in Wooster, Lemster, Chester, Much Winlock, and Evesham. They gave jewelry to adorn statues of the Virgin at St. Paul's Cathedral in London. Many of the valuable gifts would have been taken by the Normans after 1066, 
Many of the monasteries stood until the dissolution of the monasteries in the 16th century. But how does this all fit with the legend that we all know of the beautiful English noblewoman riding naked through the streets of Coventry? The first description of Godiva's ride was in a history written by a monk named Roger of Wendover in the 13th century. In that story, her husband Leofric had levied oppressive taxes on the city of Coventry. Godiva, particularly interested in Coventry since it was on land that she inherited, pestered her husband to reduce the taxes. He rebuked her, but she was persistent, and so exasperated, he told her that he would grant her wish if she would ride naked through the town. To his surprise, she did, covered only by her long hair, and he therefore kept his word. But why would an English earl want his wife riding naked through town? Some describe it as an insult, an attempt to humiliate his wife for challenging him. Others describe it as a test of faith, testing both her piety and willingness to supplant herself before God and the piety of the people of Coventry. But it begs the question, did the famous ride actually occur? Most historians think not, owing to the fact that there is no contemporary record, and the first account comes nearly 200 years after the supposed event. But one thing we do know, if Lady Godiva's ride did occur, it was almost certainly not as described. For example, the claim that she was riding to convince her husband to reduce taxes makes no sense. Coventry was her land, not his. In Anglo-Saxon England, a woman could own land and was in charge of that land. In short, taxes over what was then the new and small town of Coventry were hers to control, not his. And it is highly unlikely that her brutal lord would have tried to humiliate her. In Anglo-Saxon England, she could divorce him, even an earl, and still keep her property. In short, the 13th century description is grounded in 13th century culture following the Norman conquest, rather than the Anglo-Saxon culture where it supposedly occurred. The motivation of freedom from excessive taxes described in the 13th century account, for example, came from the same era that created the legend of Robin Hood. Rather, if the Countess of Mercia rode naked through Coventry, it was far more likely that the motivation was much different. It was, much more likely, an act of penance. In medieval culture, self-debasement, especially the removal of the trappings of wealth, was a common way to seek forgiveness by God for sins. And if Lady Godiva was seeking God's forgiveness, taxes may actually have been involved after all. In 1041, Canute's son, Hartha Canute, had become king. Not trusting the English lords, he increased the size of his army and navy, requiring a significant and highly unpopular increase in tax rates. As a result, two of Hartha Canute's tax collectors were overwhelmed and killed by angry citizens in the town of Worcester. Incensed at this attack on his authority, Hartha Canute ordered Leofric to raise the town. With no choice to defy the king, Leofric destroyed the town, which was on his own land, and the surrounding area, leaving, it was said, not one grain barn standing. He donated money there the rest of his life, hoping to preserve his legacy. If Lady Godiva humbled herself before God, it was most likely in penance for that most terrible event. There are many theories to explain the ride if in fact it even occurred. Some say that naked might only have meant taking off her jewelry and letting down her hair. Others say it was a pagan fertility ritual, and still others suggest that it was just a story told by Leofric's enemies to embarrass him. But whatever happened or did not happen in the 11th century was most certainly transformed when the story was first written down 200 years later, and that has continued to occur. For example, over time, the ride has become much more sexualized, with the portrayals of Lady Godiva being younger and more beautiful. The story of Peeping Tom, one villager who looked and who, depending upon the story, was either struck dead or blind for peeping, wasn't added until the 17th century, a Puritan spin of divine retribution put into the tale. By the 1900s, it was little more than a titillating tale for prudish Victorians. The rite has been reenacted tongue-in-cheek in the Coventry Fair, usually portrayed by a, an actress in, in scantily clad dress, or sometimes even by a man in the wig, between the 1600s all the way to the 1960s. And the tradition has been revived since the 1990s as part of Coventry's Godiva Festival, which is billed as the largest free family music festival in the UK. She's been commemorated in portraits, in poetry, famously by Lord Tennyson, in song, in more than a dozen films, one of which included the Three Stooges, in chocolate. It is all a very odd legacy for a woman for whom the historical record mostly notes her charity to the church. There's so much we don't know about her. We don't know when she was born. We don't know when she married Leofric. We can only guess at when she died. She was in the great Domesday Survey in 1066, is still owning her lands seven years after Leofric's death and making her one of the few Anglo-Saxon nobles and very few women to maintain their lands after the Norman Conquest, which was an achievement in herself. But 
she was not in that survey in 1086, meaning that she died somewhere in between. And it perhaps says more about us than her that all she's remembered for is taking off her clothes. The ride might not even have happened, and if it did, it's not for the reasons that we seem to think. And maybe she deserves to be remembered for more than just what was hidden under her golden hair. Now is the part of the episode where we get to chat with the history guy about what we heard, what we're going to hear, and some behind-the-scenes stuff you only get to hear about on the podcast. And we'd also like to welcome Betty Jo back, my grandmother and the history guy's mom. Uh, you, you filmed this one, I think both of them, five mm -hmm. years ago. And I, one of the things that kind of uh, yeah. interested me as, as I was watching them and listening to them was how, how much things have changed in terms of how you've recorded. And, the, and so I wanted yeah, to ask yeah. about that. I mean, it, the tone of the channel has remained. And I really love watching these videos. These are good stories. But yes, in terms of the quality of the audio and the video and the, the quality of the yeah. photographs, some are very pixelated. I was always surprised when I see the old episodes to see how much we've learned and how, and how much, you know, the, the History Guide channel has changed. But the thing is, those would still be, if I filmed them today, uh, the, you know, the pictures would be clearer and I'd probably talk a little slower. Uh, but they would still be essentially the same story. So I'm, I'm proud of the channel. I'm proud that even those old things, just when I started, when I, when I didn't know what the channel really was, that they still had the sort of vision that I like. And I think they're both really good stories. But you can certainly tell watching them, especially, I don't know if you'll tell as much listening on here, but if you can tell watching them that uh, we've gotten much better at finding media and improving media quality and et cetera than we, when we did it. It's been a, it's, it's a learning curve on figuring out all that stuff. It is. Because, you know, as, as long as I've been it with is. the channel. And it was self, totally self-taught. Yeah, right? <laughs> no, no one's ever given me instruction on how to make a video. I, I, I I learned, I've, I've learned quite a bit from you in terms of uh, how, how to find images and make sure it's in the public domain and stuff like that because that, that's, that's a really big deal for us. We always try to keep everything in the public domain, uh, which can be can mm -hmm. be difficult especially depending on what topic we're doing but i these you know these these uh, these episodes you're right they they really they still hold up really really well and even if they're a little mm -hmm. less uh polished i guess you might say the uh, the everything else about them is very much the history guy and uh, the only thing mm -hmm. that the only thing that what you might do a little different this time is you might uh you you were trying to keep them within those like five well I think at this point it wasn't so much yeah, five minutes, yeah. but still like under under ten. And yeah, I was I was I was so intent on keeping the video short that I started just talking too fast. Uh, and and I feel like now that the goal is to say tell the story and don't worry about the length of time it takes to tell the story. Uh, and then I think this little you know still people lots of people who tell me that I talk too fast, but you can tell a, a big difference from videos made today and those videos that are in there when I when I was really speeding it up. But if you look at my very earliest videos, I was talking fairly slowly and it's just the scripts yeah. have grown because I've kind of figured out how to tell a story more and how to research more. And as the scripts grow and they're longer, then the, you know it's, it's changed how fast I'm trying to talk to finish a script. So the goal today is to say, tell the story and don't worry yeah. if it rolls over 15 minutes. Uh, and that's I think that's worked out pretty well. But even then, even, you know, talking a little too fast. And uh, you <laughs> believe me, I used to collegiate debate. I can talk way faster than you've ever heard me talk on The History Guy. Uh, I, I still think that they are they're compelling stories that keep you going and listening. And, and so they, if I were to produce the same videos today, they might look a little different. But, I mean, they would be essentially the same. And, and I like that. I like that The History Guy is still The yeah, History Guy. Yeah, me too. I think, that, I think that you had a good vision for this. Uh, for you know what you were going to do from the very beginning and it's I'm, I'm glad that it's been something that's really worked so well well and it um uh it's really interesting i was watching as he was listening to himself and when and when one of them went off he went that's really good and it's <laughs> uh i find myself and i told him i can look back at things that i wrote in my magazine uh 15 years ago and read it and say you know somebody really had a way with words <laughs> and so uh i think if something stands a, if it stands the test of time with ourselves, then it probably was worth producing in the, to begin with. And yeah, well, one of the first rules that I always had is make videos that, that I would want to watch. Because I figure if I would want to watch those, someone else would too. And I still do. I mean, I don't know if that sounds very egotistical or what, but I still watch old episodes of mine and I like And sometimes they make me laugh and sometimes they make me cry. Uh, and I get done and saying, that's, you know, that's something I would want to watch on YouTube. And that, that's, it was kind of cool to pull out some of these older ones I hadn't watched in a while and say, really, I do appreciate those. I think they're good stories. And I hope that people go back and find yeah. them. Uh, and some of those have, I mean, had lots and lots of people have found them, but some of them, you know, when we made them, um, no one was watching, uh, and they've never quite found their audience. And so uh, it's good uh, to do things like the podcast here, where we bring some of those kind of out of the closet and 
let people go see them again because they're both really are all three yeah. of these actually today are really interesting yeah. and stories. you know these are these are really really interesting stories um when it when it comes to the lone ranger I, he's largely i mean they did some stuff in the 90s but he's pretty well before my time with the exception of the mm -hmm. uh, not terribly well received johnny depp and army <laughs> hammer oh, yeah uh, the army hammer uh, version yeah well, but I mean, everybody True. knows who he is. So, I mean, I'm sure the television shows that I watched when I was a kid were long and yeah. rerun. I mean, they were they had probably been made you know, ten or twenty years before I watched them. Uh, and I think I saw some of the cartoons. But I mean, he's been he's been comics, he's been uh, uh, comic strips, uh, several movies, uh, dozens of movies, yeah. and and uh, uh, two television series. I mean, it's it is a very popular character. But the interesting thing about the Lone Rangers, this wasn't pulled from literature. Yeah. This was created as a radio yeah. show. Uh, and so it was really creative for sound, for radio. Well, that's kind of interesting. Uh, and it says something about the history of the character. I mean, an important thing to say when you talk about the history of the Lone Ranger is that uh, the, the Lone Ranger was not based on any real no. person. Uh, unlike some, some, the Lone Ranger was a, a fictional character. The, the the men who created him didn't didn't mention any actual rangers or anything like that. They said that he was really inspired by like Tom Mix yeah. and and old westerns. Uh, and so when we look in this particular episode, we look at a couple of people who uh, whose uh, characters whose lives yeah. look something like the Lone Ranger. But we're not trying to say that they were the Lone Ranger because they're they're probably there's no indication that they knew who yeah. Bass Reeves was when they created the Lone Ranger. But one of the things that they did really well was when he came off of the radio and went on film, is they picked a really good looking dude to play the part. Yeah, which one? And so us, us ladies can appreciate that too. <laughs> which one are we talking about? There's so many Lone Rangers. <laughs> well, they all look alike. That's they true. all wear masks. Like that, <laughs> so, that's what you want is a guy on a white horse and a mask, so you never have to know what he looks like. <laughs> I didn't know that about women. I have to buy myself a man. Uh, you know, it's it is really interesting. I you know I like these stories like this one. You're right. We're to some extent we're we're talking about people who could have been an inspiration, but probably weren't for for mm -hmm. the actual character. But it's I think it's interesting for us to you know to look at this, even though as you mentioned in the video, we we you couldn't even we couldn't be sure if they knew anything about these guys, or even if they did, that they were directly you know connected. Yeah, that they were directly inspired by it. But, I mean, the thing that's interesting about it is that, you know, this is truly a total yeah. fictional character and, and very much like an archetype and things like that. But uh, that that idea that you had someone out there enforcing the law, they're just by themselves with one companion. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, that 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 we had people who actually behaved yeah. very much like the, the stories in The Lone Ranger. Uh, and those, you know, that's awfully brave to go out and do that. And and so it's, it's interesting to say that even if they didn't think about it at all, even if they didn't inspire it at all, uh, that uh, that yeah. still uh, the Lone Ranger ended up reflecting what some of the Wild West. Yeah, actually right. There's like. there's an interesting piece of uh, you know, connection to this this human history where they might not have been thinking mm -hmm. of them, but gosh, these are people who who remind us of that that hero, that fictional hero. And I, I mean, Bass mm -hmm. Reeves was was a really interesting, a really interesting guy, he was, and yeah. and someone who you know they don't talk about a lot, and I. They don't. I mean, you, you find it more, more because we're days. kind of seeking out more, you know, African American heroes and stuff like that. So, so actually, when we when we looked it up today, there were quite a few YouTube videos on it. Mine was before <laughs> most of those because I was ahead of the curve. But uh, uh, he is a really fascinating guy, and he certainly, uh, you know, deserves yeah. to be remembered. And uh, you know, it's, to some extent, he's not really like. I mean, he didn't have the Lone yeah. Ranger's backstory. He didn't wear a mask. <laughs> and but on the other hand, this is a guy that went through lawless territory uh, with nothing but an Indian companion who would have been a, yeah. a Native American uh, member of the posse, uh, and went out there, you know, taking on all sorts of outlaws and bad guys. And uh, some of the some of his exploits could have very much been an episode yeah. of the Lone Ranger. You know, he 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 wore uh, 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 disguises, and and he uh, you know he. Uh, would kind of fool people into giving up themselves. Uh, and I mean, really, it's just a clever and interesting man. Uh, and it's interesting because, you know, he grew up enslaved. Uh, he escaped slavery. Uh, he became wealthy, uh, but he never became literate. Uh, and still, uh, I mean, I mean, the idea, I mean, think of a man so smart that if you just read him the wanted posters, he would just keep that all in his head for yeah. weeks at a time. Uh, you know, and he accomplished so much given that, you know, given where he started and wasn't given the, you know, the opportunities. I mean, he had to be just utterly yeah. brilliant. So, yeah, I would love yeah. to have met Bass Reeves and talked to him. I don't know. He, he, he I wonder how gruff he was. I wonder how wild it's, west he was. It's an interesting you know? question on that because I, I don't know. He's not, uh, he's not in some ways the, you know, the, the typical kind of movie 
uh, cowboy. And yet mm -hmm. I still wonder, I wonder like, you know, what, what was it like to live a really rough and tumble life? And for someone who certainly yeah. was, was doing as much as any other, uh, you know, Western uh, gun gunslinger kind of guy, he, cer he certainly was. Well, I mean, yeah, actually yeah, lawmen. lawmen I, many of the lawmen in the Wild West were actually outlaws first. He was not. I mean, he was he was always a lawman. And, uh, but he did, uh, didn't he, he face some charges for murder? At some point, yeah. That, that was in, and I think he was acquitted of those charges. So, yeah, I think it was probably not easy uh, enforcing law uh, in a lawless territory where uh, outlaws would literally yeah. go there because it was a lawless territory. It's It's... Fascinating. One Fascinating of the things guy. that I think really connects him to the Lone Ranger is he does seem to have had a, a fairly, I mean, especially for the the West, a fairly strict uh, sense of justice. He, you know, he arrested his own son, yeah, uh, who had killed his wife, and that's yeah. a, that's it's a rough thing, especially in the you know in this kind of lawless land where uh, you you might be able to get away with something like that by just letting them escape, but that wasn't what. So maybe he did really operate yeah. by that code. You know, it's pretty questionable whether some of the others, you know, like. Uh, uh, Pat Masterson yeah. or, or uh, other, you know, law well, the, the, the Earps, or the Earps, or anything, whether they really operated yeah. by that same kind of code. Bass Reeves seems to have. So certainly, I mean, he's he's an inter and you know, honestly, they should make a movie about him. You, you don't have to. The thing about it is, it's almost cheapens him to say, oh, he was the, you know, he was the, yeah. the Lone Ranger because he was a, a really interesting yeah. person in himself, and he, I think, he could make a fascinating character and a fascinating. Absolutely. Movie. He's got to have enough guy. stories from all, all yeah. the stuff that he did, and. Yeah, yeah, he'd be a yeah. great Western series. Absolutely, he would. Be a great center character for a Western series. So the next story uh, that that you tell is it's it's very different. <laughs> it's a very different story, very different mm -hmm. era. But in some in some ways, it's it's not any less legendary. And unlike uh, you know Bass Reeves, where we're yeah. talking about she was a, yeah. she was a real person, and we know she was a real person. But virtually everything you've ever heard about her doesn't there's yeah. no historical explanation for that so i mean you know quite possibly she never rode naked but i mean she gosh um i mean at a time uh, when very few of those anglo-saxon nobles nobles are yeah. keeping their land and keeping their title she's doing that and at a time when you you just don't even remember yeah. women's names they're not even making the record she was she was keeping her land and and uh, being of note uh, i mean so she had to be an absolutely extraordinary woman uh yeah even though you know what we understand about her the reason that she's remembered today on you know chocolate yeah. or something like that it really has nothing to do with who she was so i do i like the end of that when they say it's kind of interesting that we've got that whole story when the only thing we really know about her historically is that she gave stuff <laughs> yeah. to churches i mean that's but the fun thing about doing that is that uh since she's such a, sh a shadowy character uh no wonder there's so many stories about her and who knows what possibly could yeah have been absolutely yeah. Well, absolutely, yeah. But one of the things that's interesting is you—they always portray Godiva as being like yes. a beautiful woman, right? And Nick that was, and she would have been very much into her, you know, late yeah. middle age by the time that she did it. So it wasn't—it uh, it, it <laughs> clearly was not quite what we think of the ride, and that's quite not quite what the picture is on the yeah. chocolate bars. I wonder if the horse looked that good. <laughs> yeah, I wonder how. Even if she had that. Yeah, that some of those, uh, and it's fun to do. And uh, you know, I'll say we kind of snuck in there because some of those paintings are a little bit nude, and, and it's yeah. never been. <laughs> Never been demonetized. <laughs> I, uh, so, we, uh, I guess it's okay right. if it's a painting. Uh, but uh, yeah, some of those horses are pretty fancy. Well, I wonder what kind of horse she was really riding there. Because a couple of the statues are a little bit yeah. visuous too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's uh, and it's interesting because that's all that all kind yeah. of came later. That whole that whole kind of sexualized idea of her came later. And that they are still. I mean, they still yeah. reenact that ride now at the Coventry Music Festival. I mean, it's it's just fascinating how that is carried. But it's also kind of a story in historiography. Uh, yeah. And the development of legend, because really how she was perceived, uh, you know, 200 years ago, 100 years ago, 50 years ago is different than it is today. Uh, and, and, you know, the first story, the first time the story of the ride was written was 200 yeah. years after she was supposed to, after she supposedly lived. So her story has transformed yeah. so very much. Uh, and so another one, like it would be wonderful to go back in time and I don't know what kind of conversation you could have with her, uh, but uh, in old English, but uh, it would be wonderful to find out yeah. what she really was like, because it's that is that legend has transformed her. So very it's much. it is it really is interesting because it seems like uh, there is it's at, at the very least a real possibility that there was some kernel of truth to this. It seems a little strange to think that they would have just come up with, you know, chosen her out of. At, for no reason, but well, it's not, hard to... the, the first the first story about her riding naked was actually written by someone who was uh, uh, apparently trying to uh, 
represent the Ilfric badly. Okay. So, I mean, there's there's reason to think that it could have been. And that, in that case, again. So. But I mean, there's a. But if you understand the culture at the time, there might have been a very important cultural yeah. reference to that, especially if you see it as an act of penance, uh, uh, as an act of humility, or something like that. Uh, then that, it makes a lot more sense, kind of, than the story that we've heard. Uh, and uh, so, I mean, I, the way I heard always was like she did it to kind of spite her husband, and that's probably yeah. not what happened. So it's it's interesting to see in context why that could have happened, uh, even if we don't know for yeah. sure that it, that it did happen, especially for someone who was really known for being pious and, and giving large donations to the church and et cetera. Uh, and uh, she certainly knew, I mean, she must have navigated politics in some really extraordinary ways. Yeah, so I mean, I you know, another person I'd love to meet, another person with yeah. the lesson is very different. And what I can say about this one is that the research was really, really fun yeah. to do, uh, because it's because uh, uh, when you you really had to dig through a bunch of layers before you got to what do we actually yeah. know about Godiva, and that she was real, and that's that's almost uh, it. Uh, but she was, you know, yeah, that's almost it. Yeah, well, she was real, and she was yeah. extraordinary. She was she was making it into the Doomsday Book when not very many women yeah. would have made it in the Doomsday Book, and she was making it for years and years when a lot of an awful lot of those nobles didn't make it yeah. through the changes that occurred during that a rather period. tumultuous period. It's it's uh, I mean I, it's such yes. an interesting period of English history because you know this is after uh, Alfred has kind of made this this whole concept of an England mm -hmm. uh, to exist even, and then it goes through so much, and of course eventually uh, Wessex, mm -hmm. the House of Wessex, comes back with. Uh, uh, what, mm -hmm. yeah. with Edward the uh, but it's it. it's it's interesting because yeah. it's so much of that uh, you know this is a part of history where England was tied very closely to Scandinavia and you know now these days I, th yeah. I don't think we usually would connect them quite as closely but I mean that was a that was a very close historical connection mm -hmm. of course that you could say that about France too because of the the Normans and stuff like that mm -hmm. yeah the Normans, it's, yeah. it's an interest interesting so it is interesting and of course this this video is yes. partly about that history of that period and, and uh, so uh, uh, but you have to kind of understand that period to understand uh, you know where where yeah. she came from. So it's really, I mean, uh, you know, I, I enjoyed researching the story. It's interesting to hear how it might tie to other legends of the period. And so if you try to understand things like the uh, the, the Arthurian legends, the Robin Hood legends, uh, and uh, you, you try to tie those to, you know, the Godiva legend, and you can see how a lot of these were yeah. morality plays that were intended to teach a lesson. And as society changed, as the lessons they wanted to change, uh, then the stories changed. And so that means that what we're getting is someone who's been, you know, so, you know, changed her whole vision manipulated yeah. over time uh, uh, that the, you know, the, the woman who we most know for charity to the church is now mostly remembered for writing naked yeah. through town. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it does. It's interesting that this story has, has, it has stood the test of time. It makes you wonder exactly what, uh, you know, what yeah. makes a, a legend like this survive. I mean, very, very prominently in the modern in the modern day. Yeah, I, I think you could make another really good movie uh, that gave more context to the to yeah. the ride. That could really be you know, kind of. Yeah, that could be an interesting one. They've been doing some some kind of interesting, yeah, yeah. powerful central character. Magellan TV is sponsoring this episode, and they sponsor all of our podcasts. And if you've listened to the podcast, you know that what we like to do is talk about what we've been watching on Magellan TV lately. And so what have you been watching on Magellan TV? So my mom is here, and you've heard her on here. Everybody knows Betty Jo. But so we, we do enjoy, like, uh, mystery shows, uh, uh, you know, detective shows. So we decided to look at true crime, and we're flipping through. And I saw something. It's called Sleepwalkers Who Kill. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, wow! I've never heard of that. <laughs> so it was—it's not really a detective show, but it was an interesting study in science. Uh, and I—I, I, you know, I think it's not a shock that you might have a bad dream and you end up, you know, you're flailing around and you can whack your—you you, know—you can whack someone in bed with you. But uh, uh, you know, there's a dude that stabbed his wife 44 times, rolled her in the swimming pool to drown her, uh, washed himself off and put the clothes in his trunk. <laughs> <laughs> and claims that he was sleepwalking. But there's another guy who drove 14 miles and killed his mother-in-law and claimed he was sleepwalking. And so it's really interesting to, to hear them trying to figure out the science yeah. of it to see if this, and then see if a jury will believe. So the one guy uh, that killed his mother-in-law was actually quick. Really? But, uh, but, the guy, but the guy in Arizona, they just didn't buy that he'd do all that when they sleep. They did say, uh, and, would, and would you... Uh... Uh, would you like to be around this person? And Brad and I both very loudly said, no. <laughs> so, imagine, imagine you're in prison and there's your cellmate is the guy that murders in the sleep. Yeah, that's a... Uh, hmm. <laughs> anyway, if you want a little bizarre thing to watch, you know, before you go to bed at night, why we recommend this. It was fascinating. I had no idea. You know, I did, so actually it's, it's kind of a mix of science and mystery and, and true crime. And it's a hoot and a half.
I don't know. That's funny to say we're laughing about it. We had to murder his wife, but it's just it's a who to have trying to figure out could this be yeah, real? They, uh, and and uh, I mean it's it's almost I mean part of it you're almost like is this a spoof documentary? But no, this wow. is this is these are real discussions. Absolutely worth your way. It was totally fascinating. Totally worth your watch. What have, and, what have you been watching on Magellan TV? So what I watched was I love giraffes, huh? uh, but what I what I watched yeah. was called The Last of the White Giraffes. And it is about this specific, uh, possibly species, but probably subspecies of giraffe that live in uh, Niger. And Niger is an incredibly, incredibly poor country. Um, mostly they live essentially on subsistence. And there is a population of giraffes there that essentially was almost completely hunted out of existence. And so this story was about uh, how they were trying to keep the small population of giraffes alive and also kind of how these giraffes live there and how how they're dealing with uh, growing farms and people who are trying to survive and who find the giraffes to be a nuisance. And what, what was kind of interesting about it to me is I, I live in Wyoming and we have lots of ranchers here who complain about it and they complain about the bison at Yellowstone and the wolves. The arguments against the giraffes are very, very similar. And it's essentially the same problem is mm -hmm. that these are humans trying to trying to uh, survive and they they need to eat their millet and they need wood to, you know, to burn fires. And the giraffes are in the way they want to eat all the they don't eat the millet, but they walk through the, the fields and they do all kinds of damage. And of course, they want to eat acacia trees and there are only so many acacia trees and you have to clear those to do farming. And so it's kind of kind of the, the process of how we're trying to keep these giraffes alive and really work with the community because the, mm -hmm. I mean, just like, just like, you know, we've done in the, the United States that those farmers would love to put barbed wire fences up around their crops, but that's, that's a problem for the giraffes who, uh, especially when you have cut down most of their trees and they, they have to be able to get to those trees somehow. We have actually written yeah. a number of giraffe episodes and giraffe, giraffes in history is a larger topic than you might've guessed. Uh, that's, uh, you know, there's a lot of, species that are endangered by uh, yeah. instability i'm i'm also uh, well, and, and and just uh, demographics of yeah. uh, uh, in uh, my business which is the cattle business why uh, occurs right here right now uh, all of a sudden then you build a house next to a feed yard or you build a house under stapleton airport which is which is the reason some of my friends moved uh, and then you complain about the fact but Moral of the story is who's encroaching yeah. on who yeah. uh, and and how and how do you live, live learn to live together and of course, if you are a listener or watcher of The History Guy, you can always go to try.magellantv.com slash historyguy, where we will always have a deal for you, sometimes a free month or a deal on an annual membership, or even a documentary that you can watch for free. Again, that's try.magellantv.com slash historyguy. Now, The History Guy tells the true story of Johnny Appleseed. Imagine that you're living on the American frontier in the early part of the 19th century and you see a man walking down the trail. He's average height, he's got blonde hair, he's got blue eyes, but he appears to be dressed in rags. Looks like he's wearing a rough spun bag with holes cut in it for his head and his arms. He's not wearing any shoes and he looks like he's carrying like a coffee sack with him. What might you think of such an eccentric creature? You've probably heard of Johnny Appleseed. He's part of American folklore like Paul Bunyan or John Henry. But unlike Paul Bunyan and John Henry, Johnny Appleseed was based on a real man named John Chapman. He's usually presented as a lanky fellow who wore a long-handled cooking pot on his head and threw apple seeds wherever he went. But like any legend, the reality is more complex, more interesting, and, well, more human than the legend. The life of the man who came to be known as Johnny Appleseed deserves to be remembered. John Chapman was born in Lemonster, Massachusetts on September 26, 1774, the second child of Elizabeth Simons and farmer Nathaniel Chapman. His father fought as a Minuteman at the Battle of Bunker Hill, and later served as an officer under General George Washington, helping construct the defenses of New York against the British. He served with the Continental Army from 1777 until 1780, which time he was honorably discharged at Springfield, having attained the rank of captain early in the colonial struggle. Chapman's mother, Elizabeth, passed away from tuberculosis while his father was at war, and when he returned, Nathaniel remarried a woman named Lucy Cooley in 1780. He had ten more children with her. Little is known about Chapman's early life, but we do know that his father encouraged his son to become an orchardist, he also must have instilled a king's sense of business in his son, which was to play a large role in what came next. <laughs> 
it was the time of the American frontier. People were pushing out into unbroken land. They were establishing farms, making land claims, and pushing the Native Americans farther west. Both governments and private land companies encouraged the growing of orchards because they were seen to have a settling influence. If, if you came and claimed that you were going to stay there and establish a community, well, creating and tending an orchard was seen as something that would tie you to the land and prove your intent to stay. This type of thinking was seen in 1792 when the Ohio Company of Associates, a real estate company formed of businessmen from Massachusetts, stated that anyone willing to form a permanent homestead on the wilderness beyond Ohio's first settlement would receive 100 acres of land, but would be required to plant 50 apple trees and 20 peach trees on that land. This requirement is where Chapman found the business opportunity that he would pursue for the rest of his life. At age 18, Chapman headed west to Pennsylvania with his 11-year-old half-brother Nathaniel, where he began his life as a nurseryman on the frontier. His first apple tree nurseries were planted in the Allegheny Valley in Pennsylvania around 1798, where he then collected seeds, picking them from cider mills around the Potomac River before traveling west along through Ohio, leaving his brother behind with friends. He kept well ahead of the pioneers and almost eerily predicted where they would settle next, planting nurseries in those spots. After clearing the land and planting the orchards, Chapman fenced them in with natural materials like fallen trees or logs, bushes or vines. This helped protect the orchard as leaving trees without a surrounding fence in the open resulted in attracting nearby populations of black bears, woodchucks and other wild animals looking for food. Once the orchard was on its way, he left it in the hands of a caretaker and moved on to establish a new nursery on the ever-expanding frontier border. Chapman returned to his established nurseries once pioneers began to settle the land in the area and sold the trees for a fippenny bit, or about six and a quarter cents. If the settlers didn't have the money, he was known to barter with them or extend them credit, lending some credence to the folklore figure Johnny Appleseed's legendary generosity. And he could afford to be generous. The nurseries Chapman planted became his property simply through his creation of them. When he died, he had over a thousand acres in his possession. He didn't flaunt his wealth, though, and preferred to live a simple and itinerant life, free from the responsibilities of family or permanent home. Some of these life choices were driven by Chapman's religious beliefs. Chapman was a follower of the Church of New Jerusalem, which was a Christian faith that was based upon the teachings of scientist and philosopher Emanuel Swedenborg. Among their beliefs was the idea that man could most experience God through nature, and that a good life was one that was lived through simplicity. Very uncommon for people of his time, Chapman was a practicing vegetarian and a vocal advocate of nature and animals. These beliefs were considered to be unorthodox and eccentric and are often left out of the children's stories about Johnny Appleseed. He purchased mistreated horses and animals that were so sick that they were going to be put down. It is best to help them heal. He took this concern for animals to legendary status when one night he observed mosquitoes flying into his fire and watching them burn. The story goes that Johnny took his tin hat, gathered water, and quenched the fire, remarking, God forbid that I should build a fire for my comfort that should be the means of destroying any of his creatures. This willingness to give up his own comfort for those of another species made it into other tall tales. Another story goes that one night Chapman made a campfire in a snowstorm at the end of a hollow log. He intended to pass the night there in comfort, but discovered a bear and cubs in the same space. So he moved his fire to the other end and slept on the snow in the open air rather than disturb the animals. And another story goes that Chapman found a trapped wolf that he freed and healed its injured leg, and the wolf followed him in his travels ever after. But before we travel too far down the path of folklore, there were some stories about Chapman's quest for nature and purity that were more eccentric, maybe even darker. He was asked once by a pioneer why he didn't marry and settle down on an orchard of his own, and he responded that no woman was pure enough for his love nor could she compare with his life of nature and simplicity. He would find a wife later, he said, in heaven, after he died. The story continues, and almost creepily, that in an effort to find a woman who met his exacting standards, Chapman arranged for a Sadler family to raise their young daughter as his intended bride. But when he saw her flirting with some boys in town, he put off the engagement because of her behavior. Perhaps these are just troubling rumors about a pious man, but Chapman never did marry or settle down.
Some who knew him describe Chapman as eccentric. While Chapman is often depicted as wearing a long-handled cook pot on his head with tattered clothes and no shoes, he did in fact wear a pot on his head, but rather it was said a tin hat that he also utilized as a bowl for his food. Although thin in appearance, Chapman was a rugged outdoorsman because of his lifestyle, walking miles each day barefoot and sleeping outdoors in lands that were known for their dangerous wildlife. His feet became so rough from his punishing existence that Chapman reportedly could push needles through the soles of his feet without pain or walk on hot coals. In another story from the era, Chapman gave away his shoes to a family traveling west who couldn't afford to buy shoes for themselves. In acts that would go on to fuel more stories of his legendary generosity, Chapman spent time teaching the settlers how to care for the trees he sold them before returning to his travels. There was nothing that required him to educate the green settlers, and in doing so, Chapman helped the homesteaders establish their land claims early in their arrival, along with leaving them a much-needed source of additional food in the fruit from the trees. The apples Chapman planted were not the dessert types one would use in cooking, but rather trees that produced cider apples. Called spitters, these apples were small and unpleasant to eat and had a bitterness and dryness, qualities that make the fruit unsuited for cooking, but instead were used to make hard cider along with certain brandies. Cider was a common staple in the American diet, as pioneers didn't always have access to sanitary drinking water. In fact, by the mid-1700s, the average pioneer was drinking an estimated 35 gallons of hard cider a year. It was also a key component of the colonial economy, since currency was often hard to come by in the colonies. Cider was often used as good as cash, with barrels of it being worked out in barter arrangements. Chapman's association with cider led one American author to refer to him as America's Dionysus. Beyond drinking it, the cider could be fermented into cider vinegar, which colonists used to preserve vegetables through pickling, helping with the storage of food, which was another constant concern on the frontier. Although there was some decline in its use by 1900, apple cider remained a part of the American diet until the rise of the temperance movement. When prohibition was enacted in 1919, FBI agents began to tear down orchards for the making of homemade hooch, destroying heirloom apple varieties that had grown since colonial times. Which brings us back to another facet of the Johnny Appleseed legend, his association with apples. Part of this legend was created by Chapman's religious beliefs. Reportedly, he refused to graft trees, a process whereby a twig or branch of an existing tree is attached to the root system of another, as he saw that as hurting the plants, and instead carried his signature look of the coffee sack of apple seeds with him to plant trees. Since Chapman didn't use grafting, which grows an apple identical to the parent tree, Chapman created the conditions for apple trees to adapt and thrive in a new environment, the American frontier. Because of this personality quirk, he is credited for the development of some of the most popular apple varieties, like the delicious and golden delicious apples. Though Chapman contributed to their dislocation, he was reportedly known and liked by indigenous American tribes encountered on the frontier's edge, although the relationship was not universally friendly. He spoke some of their languages, and they in turn admired his friendly nature and knowledge of plants, both for food and for medicinal use. Some Native Americans seem to have regarded him as someone who was touched by the Great Spirit, and generally left him alone on his travels, which were extensive. Chapman meandered from Massachusetts through western Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Indiana, eventually traveling as far as Ontario, Illinois, and West Virginia, planting and operating a chain of nurseries as he went. In 1845, after a 15-mile walk leading his black ox to repair an orchard fence that cattle had trampled down, he contracted pneumonia. That night, Chapman visited a friend named William Worth, ate bread and milk, read the Bible, and laid on the floor to sleep. The next day, Chapman didn't wake up. He died at age 70 on March 11, 1845. At his death, the itinerant wanderer owned more than 1,200 acres of land and four plots in Allen County in Indiana, including a nursery with an estimated 15,000 trees. Chapman is believed to have owned even more lands that he lost track of due to his poor bookkeeping. He left all his property to his sister. Today, there's a 176-year-old tree in Nova, Ohio, which is one of the last known to have been planted by Chapman himself. Although the lifespan of most fruit trees is only 15 to 45 years, this tree will live on using the method that Chapman didn't employ, grafting. The seeds and cuttings have been used to propagate hundreds of new Johnny Appleseed trees in the time since its planting. You can also visit his birthplace in Lemonster, Massachusetts, where there's a recreation of his childhood home. It's unclear when Chapman picked up his famous nickname, but the name and the legend didn't become popular in America until decades after his death. But eventually the legend of Johnny Appleseed captured the nation's imagination and cemented itself in American folklore. And 
like any legend, it's difficult to separate the myth from the reality, and there are questions about most of the popularly told stories about his life. But the reality of the man, his, his strange appearance, his eccentric beliefs about animals and nature, his distinctive lifestyle, have inspired millions to plant trees and help others. And maybe that's all that anyone can hope for in life, is to create a life that inspires, a life that deserves to be remembered. John Chapman's memorial gravesite is in Fort Wayne, Indiana, where they hold a yearly festival. There's a marker at the site that bears the motto, He lived for others. Uh, this story about Johnny Appleseed is, is a particularly interesting one and in kind of the, the way we're talking mm -hmm. about legends and how they're, how they form, uh, you know, I knew of Johnny Appleseed, but not, uh, I don't know that I was all that familiar with all the pieces of his uh, legend, but like he, his name is everywhere mm -hmm. still. And there's, there's a Johnny Appleseed, mm -hmm. uh, like a, like they, they sell plants and stuff here, here in uh, Casper. And it's yeah. really interesting. Yeah, he knew marketing. Yeah. I mean, it certainly was a great name, yeah. Johnny Appleseed. It's interesting yeah. how this, you know, this his legend has uh, lived well beyond his story, but has grown so well beyond it that he's yeah. he's a figure whether you know all the stories or not. So I mean, he's a significant person. Uh, the the fact that he went and planted all these orchards really did uh, mean yeah. something to westward expansion. Uh, you know, you can certainly argue about the the value of westward expansion or whatever you want to in the United States, but certainly. We would not have been able to move uh, through the frontier in the way that we did if it weren't for him going and planting yep. these orchards. Who knew that when he died, he had thousands of acres of yeah. land that he just would claim because because if you improve that land, you got that land. So who knew that he was rich? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, that's an interesting story in itself. I, so I don't know. You know, when they talked about Johnny Appleseed, I don't know if I really understood when I was a kid and I heard the story uh, that uh, he really was that whole idea of the yeah. orchards. But I mean, what he was doing was really growing yeah. the nation, that, he, that he's, you know, this... This funny guy that they always kind of picture with a pot on his head uh, was actually, you know, it was more than just a kind of a funny folk hero. It was a guy that that really had the vision yeah. of where the nation was going and went out ahead of it uh, to do the improvements that were necessary for someone to come in a wagon and survive. It's honestly <laughs> and the fact brilliant that, and the fact that they uh, that they wanted that they thought that part of a part of the expansion was apples and peach yeah. trees. Yeah, I thought it was fascinating that they yeah. uh, they actually that tied uh, you to the land. Yeah, they, 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 really wanna... they identified that. As something that you would stay and harvest that so you would stay in one place, which is yeah. was, was important in those days. Because we've got an episode on apples and entomology, but I mean that was that was it. It, it was uh, there were laws that said if you want a homestead, you have to plant so much uh, in terms of fruit trees, uh, because they saw that as a way to make yeah. sure people wouldn't just you know come stop and then go. Uh, that they would that they would stay with the land. So he's really an interesting guy. But I mean, there's a lot in that episode that's kind of yeah. fascinating to find out his kind of religious beliefs and uh, uh, and I mean, I, I, a lot of that you know just doesn't kind of make it in the in the story that we yeah. heard as as kids. Uh, and it, some of that stuff is kind of quirky when you heard his his religious beliefs and, and and things like that. But you know, on the other hand, this is a guy that just thought you live with nature yeah. and that you put other people ahead of yourself. Uh, and you know, the, this idea, whether it's legend or whether it's true, that he put out his fire and slept in the cold because he thought the fire would kill mosquitoes uh that's 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 someone who you know really stood by yeah. principle uh and you know that's you know that's worth uh remember it deserves to be remembered he was, he was really an odd fellow and it's i mean it's, you know when you hear the story it's the even the legend you think oh he i mean clearly he was a quirky fellow uh but you hear some of the pieces of this and you're like okay there's some if not necessarily totally dark uh some strange yeah. <laughs> have it having people raise a daughter just yeah. for him uh, yeah and then and and then he yeah. leaves her because he doesn't think she's pure enough because she flirts with boys when she's a teenager that is that is interesting but i mean he was strange enough that part of the way that he could wander in a time when it was fairly yeah. dangerous when the native peoples uh, did not necessarily have good relations with white people one of the ways that he did that was that he was he seemed always so strange uh, and they kind of had this belief that if you were touched, you were touched by the great spirit and just kind of leave. So there were times when he thought he was being pursued by Indians where he would just do something that appeared so crazy that they would just like walk away. Right. You know, you don't mess with that guy because maybe it's <laughs> contagious or something. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, he was truly strange. I mean, he's almost yeah. kind of like the, like a Tom Bombadil-like figure that he's yeah, just, I, I mean, he, yeah. he almost seems like he just walked straight out of a storybook and is doing this. Uh, and, and at a time where it, uh -huh. it wouldn't be so strange to see people trying to live this life or trying to live this philosophy nowadays. But I mean, at the time, uh, you know, he's not just wandering around. To, the, the, he's wandering around true wilderness and, and some really. Yeah, he's around true wilderness with the you know, the bears and the mountain lions and, and uh, hostile yeah. natives. And, and, and without uh, shoes. Yeah, and but at, 
and yeah, without shoes, I can't imagine. I can't go outside my. I can't even walk out to get my mail without my shoes on. Uh, yeah, he's a fascinating fellow, uh, and so it's. I mean, that he ends up being historically yeah. important in terms of what he means for the expansion on the frontier. That he ends up being incredibly wealthy because he because he disclaimed land. Uh, that he was probably just an amazing horticulturalist. Yeah. That I mean, he raised apple trees that are still alive. Uh, that everybody, even at the time, knew him, and that he could find a, anywhere he wandered where there were people, he could always find a home. They would yeah. always let him sleep there. Uh, that he was clearly a man of principle, that he was uh, in some way bridging a gap between the native people and the settlers, which was difficult at the time. I mean, all of that, I think, kind of goes beyond this idea that he was just a guy walking around with a sack of apple yeah. seeds. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's really what kind of what's come down to us. But it's interesting, you know, in this episode and in the episode you did about, um, about pomology, uh, apples were deeply connected to american culture and it's interesting because yeah. because you talk about him that he wasn't he didn't uh graft trees he was always planting new ones and these were all new apples mm. uh, because of the way apples yeah, yeah. Were. apples are heterozygote so yeah the, so the, if you use the seed of an apple it won't produce yeah. the same apple the tree that came from uh and but uh and interesting i think surprise this is that most of those were going to be used for yeah. cider and that cider was incredibly important to survival on the frontier to the point where yeah, you used it instead of yeah. water yeah yeah well i mean and it was you know you that you used it to preserve food because uh, you used cider vinegar to preserve food and uh, uh, and uh, you used it I mean it was a, a drink that was safe yeah. compared to water uh, and so, so yeah that, that idea I mean certainly the nation recognized uh, that that was critical to people being able to survive on the frontier because that was part of the rule of homesteading is that you had to plant, plant apple yeah. and pear trees and it's it's sad today because that means there were thousands of types of apples that were Johnny Appleseed apples uh, that have probably been yeah. lost now. That that we don't, you know, we don't have those varieties anymore. But it's interesting that there are still at least a couple of trees alive that presumably were planted yeah. by uh, Johnny. It's Anderson. interesting, you know, when they talk about it, the, the cider thing, which I don't think people, you know, now when we think of apples, I don't think we think of cider as the primary use of of apples, or even really a, all that significant to use of apple. Apple cider is not a, just not drank as much as it used to be. But I, the, these were things that you know defines the frontier and it's it's interesting about that to the point Absolutely where did, they yeah. were uh, the the prohibitionists are you know tearing down apple apple trees yeah we did cut down so cider pressing used to be you know big yeah. in the fall and there, I mean, there were some festivals around it but yes there, a lot of these were lost during prohibition because uh you know alcohol was illegal including alcoholic cider uh and uh so they they literally the revenues went down and cut down the trees Crazy. so that people would make cider out of them yeah and now you know now we've lost those and it's kind of interesting now because uh ciders have kind of found their little yeah. niche even in in uh, in alcohol now and you can you know you can buy types of cider like you can buy types of beer uh and but i mean that was lost for a long time it used to be your family would have had an apple tree and your family would have pressed that cider and used it in a number of different ways and it would have been part of what got yeah. you through the winter and it was probably not picking an apple off the tree and eating it or even cutting it into a pie that made you survive yeah. it was probably going to be pressed uh, and used and that's what you would use but if you go to uh, whole foods or some of the fancy stores you're going to find heritage apples like you find yeah. heritage tomatoes where somebody has found a different, yeah, a, different, yeah, yeah. Heirloom, yeah. a different variety that uh, that um, that is not the usual yeah. one that you find. Yeah. When we grew up, we had an apple tree in our yard. Yeah. I don't know. And I don't think that was probably any store variety of apple. Yeah. I don't I remember. Interesting. And, well, and it's, I mean, it's amazing how, how few kinds of apples there, there seem to be today compared to apparently that every single apple tree you yeah. plant. Uh, we select for yeah. ones that will last, that will store, that you can move to a store, that they, they tend to be crisp and sweet. And yeah, so it comes down to, and you know, there's a risk from that. There's a risk because if you get the right blight or something like that, and you, and you, you know, got a monocrop, and it takes a while to grow an apple tree. Uh, there is a risk to that. So, but I mean, I see. I would say, you know, since when I was a kid, you could only get probably a uh, a Granny Smith and a, and a yellow and a delicious, yellow red delicious, and a golden delicious. And like now, three kinds of apples. Now there's there's uh, if you go to the store, there's oh, all true. kinds of new ones yeah half a dozen. Particularly coming... most of those were you know specifically hybrid bread now that you know now these don't where you just planted a seed and saw yeah. come up came up these that they're specifically hybrid but i mean there's a lot of food well, and I, honey I think... so it is i mean it, it's interesting how these two yeah. tie together uh, and that's that's one of the things that if you in Johnny Appleseed was more than more than a legend or a yeah. folk tale or this guy that wandered the wilderness, uh, he was a guy that really helped to tame the wilderness in a way that you really wouldn't have expected. And that's one of the fascinating things about yeah. this episode. I did wonder, you know, he he was wealthy, and you do mention that he 
was uh, not necessarily yeah. the uh, most fastidious uh, record keeper. But I, how? Because yeah. how? I can't even imagine managing a large estate. It's hard enough to do that, you know, today. And then you're talking about doing it in a time before <laughs> computers or uh, where yeah. people will we're fight trying, land. We're records. trying to mow the lawn, and here this guy's got, you know, he's got 500 orchards across. He's not the even states, necessarily sure you know, he remembers with, them all. With what he didn't even have roads in between those states. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's something. I, it's, yeah. it's interesting, but I wonder. I wonder what happened to the because he passed most of those on to uh, to to his sister. Or... Yeah, and I, you know I think they're you know civilization comes along. So I I know that there are a couple of trees yeah. that at least by legend were planted by Johnny Appleseed, but I don't know if there's any of those orchards that are still around. I it would be difficult to imagine what you would do with them all, especially once the the frontier kind of passed you by. Uh, they would have been very spread out. It would have been kind of difficult to uh, to manage them in a way that. That would have made you money, yeah. short of probably selling the land, would be kind of be what I would imagine mostly happened. I I just can't imagine in that era them trying. You get like handed these thousands of acres of apple trees, and they're like, oh, good luck, good luck figuring out how to deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, but I mean, he was saying teach people how to yeah. tend the apple trees or how to tend the, yeah. the and yeah, that's it. Well, and they're an easy crop. They they basically once you get them up, but it does take a while. So. Uh, uh, his vis- his vision was yeah. sound. Very yeah, smart. Yeah, you know you can feed them. Uh, you can feed them to pigs. You can feed them to horses. Uh, you can uh, feed them to chickens. There's a lot of stuff you can do with apples. You know, and then so, I mean, somewhat similar to to Lady Godiva, uh, this is another one where you can talk about you know historiography, where his story as it changed, mm-hmm. and you know what's the most important part, and what you're supposed to learn from it, or that kind of thing has changed over time. And I always think it's interesting to because I think each piece of those, each one of those visions of Johnny Appleseed or of Lady Godiva, is itself you know descriptive of a of a period of history. And even the mm-hmm. even I mean with Lady Godiva, you know the story that we first hear that's first written down uh, is is a story that might be uh, that reflects m- possibly more about the time it was written than uh, the time it's talking about. It did, yeah. It was written two hundred years after. I, I mean, I would love if you could just mess around with history. I'd love to take Lady Godiva and watch the Three Stooges movie with <laughs> Lady Godiva. Just see, <laughs> see what she thought of where she'd become. <laughs> Say, look, here's your here's your Godiva chocolates here. Like, uh, this, you know, we hadn't even discovered chocolate yet. So, <laughs> That's right. Uh, it was in the New World. <laughs> and, yeah, 200 years away from chocolate. Uh, but, uh, uh, yeah, uh, you know, it is, the stories have changed, and that tells us about yeah. history. And so sometimes historiography, the way the stories change with history, also teaches history. And that's something about these story behind the legends sorts of, and we've got others, yeah. but these story behind the legends sorts of videos are really kind of interesting. Uh, and uh, it's it's interesting because they've got a kernel of familiarity uh, with a, a dose of unfamiliarity, uh, and still some of it just a dose of mystery that we we kind of still do wonder what you know what what they were like. Thank you for listening to this episode of the History Guy podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Forgotten History, and if you did, you can find more on our website, thehistoryguy.com. We release podcasts every two weeks, so stick around if you want to hear more podcasts of Forgotten History. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Patreon. You can even get a personalized message from the History Guy himself on Cameo.